The idea is, is you can browse to ioactive.com. You can actually see a window that contains Hotmail, but can be shown to the user, but the ioactive page can't look inside the frame can only generate the user interface, cannot actually programmatically look inside and play. Now the way this security policy works is that it's based on the name. It's based on the fact that ioactive.com is not hotmail.com. And so because of that, now you can show it to the user, but you don't get to mess around inside, don't get to automatically read the mail. The, the philosophy, the, the, the policy statement is, if two things come from the same place though, well then they can look inside. So Hotmail could have an iframe that you could look inside because Hotmail would be looking inside Hotmail. But IOActive can't look inside Hotmail. Now this seems great. You know, this is very logical. Names are great. They're wonderful. And obviously content comes from names, right? No. <laughs> content comes from IP addresses. Names don't exist except for on your client. You use DNS, oh yes, you use DNS to translate between a name to an IP address. The idea was that, you know, IOActive would have its IPs and Hotmail would have its IPs and, you know, never the twain should mix. No, that's not how it works. Uh, any site can return any address it feels like. Foo.com can return its addresses. Bar.com can return its addresses. But Foo.com can also return Bar.com's IPs. And what this means is that the idea of using the name as a summary of the security policy of saying this content is associated with this name, the problem is, is that you can get someone else's content and associate it with your name, thus being able to browse inside. So effects. At one moment, bar.com can point to a server out in Europe. Next moment, no, that's the printer down the hall. Now, suppose your browser loads a page from out in Europe. This, by the way, was a very bad slide to have when I actually was in Europe. <laughs> uh, they're like, dude, that's down the hall. <laughs> no, but suppose your browser loads a page from out in Europe, and then it switches over and goes, oh, printer down the hall. Now you have a page at bar.com, and it has another page inside, also at bar.com, but the machine out in Europe, it's given you a page that's now looking inside your printer and changing settings and redirecting all print jobs to, you know, Kazakhstan. That's not good. <laughs> so, um, you know, you might say, but, you know, what's the problem? Couldn't the server out in Kazakhstan go ahead and just connect to your printer directly? No, that's why we have corporate firewalls. Lots of people think the firewall is dead. That's because it's working really, really well. Um, that's actually kind of a problem. We've actually started to forget, you know, we used to have a lot worse security when there was no difference, when there was no such concept of a DMZ. You know, the corporate model is you have your boxes on your intranet, you have the boxes in the DMZ, and then you have the scary things out there on the internet. This model has been remarkably effective. All those that try to get around it, it's kind of funny when you actually see what people do. They'll put firewalls around individual hosts, They'll use IPsec, but it's still a very much of a model of you have the intranet hosts that can talk to each other. You have the DMZ hosts that are very, very locked down. There's very few of them because there's only a few resources that can go both ways. These are the guys that are at risk. And then you have the outside world. That model has actually, that is why all the attacks have gone to the client because the servers have actually gotten locked down pretty well. Unfortunately, what's happening is that we're using the client to get around all these firewalls, and now we can just get to the servers from behind. <laughs> Crap. So, why the attack works? Browsers don't know that bar.com from the external IP is any different than bar.com from the internal IP. This is totally by design. When you go to Google, you get a list of addresses that you can use. When you go to AOL, you get a list of addresses you could use. And you know what? They all have the same name and there's multiple IP addresses. You hope that all those addresses are actually owned by Google or Yahoo or AOL or whatever, but you don't know. Yahoo can return Google's IP, Google can return Yahoo's IP. It'll still work, it'll still go, and it'll still be under the same origin. What happened is, is that for load balancing purposes, we created a dependency on insecure behavior. This sucks. So, problem is that, you know, yeah, you can, First of all, you stop this, you'd have to detect, we'll talk about stopping this problem later. 
So what's the canonical attack? Well, the canonical attack is actually getting around a firewall. Again, firewalls are remarkably effective. They've done no amounts of good. They've done huge amounts of good in actually limiting what our server attack surface is. It's what's driven attackers to the clients. Um, the model is you bounce off a lured browser, say lured just viewing an ad on a web page, and the attacker on the outside bounces off the browser and hits internal corporate resources. So we've got a couple of different levels of access that we can get. Our first level is browser only. There's one iframe out in Europe and the other's down the hall. They have the same name, so they can script against each other. What do you get out of this by just using the browser, no plugins? Well, you get arbitrary HTTP. Now that's all, you know, just, just, just website access. There's no important websites on any corporate intranets. Next level up is web plugins, is where you start getting in MSXML, your generic XML HTTP request methods, maybe some of the stuff from Silverlight. Um, here you actually start getting not just HTTP, but some of the headers that you might want to use to interact with web services. Now what are web services? RPC in drag. Um, <laughs> So, <laughs> you think I'm kidding. Um, no, seriously. So, you know, you've had a lot of the internal resources have moved from servers, you know, Corba, RPC, that are uh, difficult to manage and have actually been just, well, we'll just do it all in XML and all will be well. It turns out that it's actually dramatically reduced the parsing load and so things are a lot easier. The problem is they're so much easier, they put in so much more crap because it's so easy to put in just one more schema element. So yeah, it's, uh, uh, web services are a big old mess. And uh, with the web plugins, you now get to bounce across into the corporate network and play with the internal web services. The final level of access are the sockets. And that's where I'm going to spend most of my time because uh, I don't want to be limited to anything. I just want to bounce off your web browser and you know, get to your file servers. Speak MySQL, speak SQL servers. Speak you know, SMB, speak RPC, speak uh, you know, NTP, whatever the heck I happen to feel like. It turns out Flash will give you arbitrary TCP access. And Java, TCP, and we'll throw in some UDP as well. Let's talk about what plugins are actually giving us. Java. This is a very instructive example because Java was the original target of the 1996 Princeton attack. From the, what they did after realizing, wow, it's 1996, but security actually exists, <laughs> they did the right thing. They totally locked down the applet interface and made it so that the applet had to download the content itself. And because the applet downloaded the instructions, it knew what IP address it came from. And because it knew what IP address it came from, it would only attach the right IP to the right content. Great. The problem is, is that there was a totally separate way you could instantiate Java objects. So they put in this big, great wall that has stood for 11 years and they put a little door over here. You just walk around. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. Uh, it's called Live Connect. It does not work in Internet Explorer. Who knows if that's intentional? But it does work in Firefox and Safari, though. And, uh, oh, it's totally rebindable. You just get to start up a Java object from within JavaScript, and Java has no idea where that JavaScript came from. It just gets a blob. Hey, can you open a socket? Okay, thanks, bye. Um, yeah, they're screwed. <laughs> so, uh, but it doesn't work in Internet Explorer. What does work in Internet Explorer is Flash. And this is sad. They tried so hard.